Hi, this is Rob Rotman. Good morning for Adapt Chicago Productions. As we begin our 15th year of doing television, promoting the disability community. And I can't think of anyone neater to have than a young woman, Lily Diego Alvarez. Lily, welcome to Adapt Chicago Productions. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Um, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, I've been a little village resident since the age of one. Um, mm -hmm. I was born in Mexico and I've lived in Chicago ever since. Um, I attended University of Illinois at Chicago for my bachelor's degree where I majored in English and general psychology. Um, and now I will start um, my graduate studies at UIC in social work. What was your education like? I mean, you know, your grade school experience like? Um, it was a little tough. I I had to learn how to speak English, and that was something mm -hmm. that I found very challenging as a as a as a young girl. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke predominantly Spanish at home, um, and at the age of five, when I started kindergarten, I was. Um, immersed in English language um, and also trying to figure out if um, I was going to simply use large print for school activities mm. or magnification or just straight into Braille. Um, so figuring all that out and learning English um, was very hard for me and learning how to read Braille as well. Mm. Um, I also it was very, it was a very, it was a moment of great transition for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting because um, one of the controversies I understand in the blind community is that, um, you know, there's a tendency now for young people not to learn Braille. I know our good friends, Kenny and Joan are very adamant that about that, that what are your feelings about that Braille may be disappearing? I think it's a shame. Um, I feel that people should whether you're completely blind or low vision, you should know how to read Braille. Um, okay. For one thing, I feel that, well, for me at least, it was a lot faster to learn how to read and write in Braille versus trying to struggle with a magnification and trying to um, uh, just read. Um, because for me, it was a very slow process. Once I started picking up um, Braille, there was no question that that is what I really wanted to do was Braille and focused less on magnification. Um, but I know a lot of people who, who they were more taught audio, um, learning things in audio, and I feel that that was a, a big disadvantage for them um, because for me, it was with Braille, it was the way I learned how to write. I learned how to spell really well. Yeah. Um, I had direct contact with words, and I feel that with audio, it it's not the same experience. Um, yeah. Although I, I love audio and I appreciate its value, um, I still think it's very important that mm. everyone, you know, blind and low vision students learn how to read Braille. Great, and you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, that um, you obviously are, you know, old enough to appreciated Harry Potter as a child. Did you read Harry Potter as a child? I did. Um, I read all seven of the books in Braille. Wow. Um, you know, the, the one thing about Braille is that there's so many volumes for one book. Wow. Um, yeah. And my mom, um, she was always overwhelmed by, because I was always a voracious reader, I read so much wow. and so fast. So there was always um, just uh, so many books everywhere in my house, braille books. Um, wow. And so for a while, we didn't quite know what to do with that. Um, but I did, I learned, I mean, I read Harry Potter and I enjoyed it very much. And it, mm. Harry Potter is still something I enjoy. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how did you get interested in poetry writing? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was very, uh, I, I enjoyed music a lot and I would hear the lyrics a lot and I liked the way the cadence of certain sentences, certain words. Right. Um, mm. But I, so I made like futile attempts at it as a child, mm. um, especially having limited 
vocabulary in English. It was kind of hard, mm. but it was something that I wanted to work towards, and I, I read a lot, so I admired a lot of authors. And um, mm. Tell us who some of your favorite authors are. Well, um, I love Sandra Cisneros, I think. Mm. The House on Mango Street, that was that was a book that I really enjoyed and I could relate to. Um, there's so many. I could yeah. I could list so many because yeah. uh, I'm an I was an English major, so yeah, I, so, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. read a lot um, mm. and I, I still do. Um, I, I enjoy Pablo Neruda's work. I think he yeah. was an excellent mm. poet. Right. Spoke about multiple things. Um, mm. So a lot of people just remember him for like you know his romantic love poems, which are beautiful. But mm. he did more than that. Yeah, was he an activist as well? Yeah, he was. Um, mm. So you know those th because I I I want to speak out for the community. I look so. for writers who. Um, who kind of have that sense in their work and and who I share my struggles with in, in terms mm. of um, having to to balance my Mexican culture and the American culture that I live in. Mm -hmm. um, so people like Juno Diaz, um, there's, there's just so many yeah. writers. Yeah. I, I had a professor at UIC who is a writer. His name is Luis Urrea, and he's awesome. Yeah. Um, and it was such a good experience to have him as a professor. That's so. great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is he a published poet? He what? is. That's he's great. a poet and also a, a an, uh, an author. He writes fiction um, mm. and nonfiction. So. That's great. Um, what other organizations are you involved with? Um, I started. Um, I started doing my uh, poetry with Enlace Chicago. They, I started doing it for community service. You know those service learning hours that they make you do in high school. Right. And Enlace was kind enough mm -hmm. to give me a chance That's and get great. up and perform. I'm, I'm not sure that they really knew that I was good. They just gave me the chance <laughs> to do yeah. it. Um, and so I found that I liked it. Um, I liked writing. Um, I liked sharing my work. Um, so I'm I'm still involved with them. Occasionally, I I do um, you know read for whatever event that they're having or college writing workshops, right. um, things like that. And I've al I'm also involved with Bodies of Work, right. which is a a uh, a network um, at UIC who l focuses on. Um, artists with disabilities and promoting disability art and right. cultures. And how did you get involved with that? And of course, the big new, the big question is, how do you get involved with our good friend, Techie Lamecki? Yeah, so um, my, I met someone at in Las Vegas, Chicago while I was doing mm. events, and she introduced me to Teresa Passioni, who has been my liaison through Bodies of Work for a while, and also we, we used to do um, Girl Scouts disability awareness presentations for mm -hmm. for Girl Scouts, um, and so I met Techie there. Um, she was she was leading some workshops for uh, mm -hmm. for for the Girl Scouts, and uh, I was doing some disability awareness things. So that's how I met yeah. her. And what kind of di stuff did you do when you did your disability awareness? Um, I talked about my experiences growing up. Um, mm -hmm. You know. I also read some of my work, and um, I would bring in some of my technology that I use, wow. my assistive technology for wow. daily living, um, and you know, interacted with them and cool. let them see how I read Braille and right. you know, mm -hmm. introduce them to that aspect. And um, that, you know, we worked on diversity together. Tell us what that process was like. Um, it was really good for me. Um, I think. We we had started figuring out how to tell our stories through that workshop um, mm -hmm. three years ago, and that was actually when my stepfather had just recently mm. passed away, maybe mm. a few weeks before we started the class. Um, mm. And so I remember Techie saying, you know, what's something that is on your mind now that you would like to talk about? Um, mm. And I wanted to talk about my stepfather's death um, because it was what was on my mind um, and so talking to to all of you who were there to also 
write your pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we hashed out what worked, what didn't. Um, and it was just such a good experience putting it all together and working mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah. What it, for? Um, I don't think we'll be able to perform that piece, but tell us what the piece was about and how you went about creating it. Um, <clears throat> so I was invited through the University of Illinois at Chicago. I was invited to perform at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival mm -hmm. of 2012. Um, and I was invited to read my poetry and also um, promote disability, um, like disability access, promote access to um, people with disabilities mm. for higher education, which I think is really important. Mm. Um, and so while I was invited to read my stepfather, you know, I found this out and then I, I also found out that my stepfather was dying of cancer. Mm. And so I, my piece is about struggling with those feelings of guilt for, for wishing that he wouldn't die during my trip. Mm but also not wanting him to suffer and also not wanting him to die. And um, mm. so I performed that piece and I talked about what it was like for me um, dealing with my blindness and feeling like I couldn't help him because of my guilt um, and then realizing that in fact, I did all I could for him. Right, and I know um, you talk about being a Seventh-day Advent at I'm sorry, Ad Adventist? Adventist, yeah. Yeah, and I was wondering, um, how has religion played an impact in your life? Um, I feel that it's a huge part of my life. Um, you know, I, I'm not the epitome of a Seventh-day Adventist religion, but mm -hmm. um, it's uh, my, the family, my biological father's family was Seventh-day Adventist mm. and um, you know my mom when he died my mom kind of for whatever reason separated and then we came back to it with mm. my stepdad as well um, and so I, I'm, I feel I'm a very spiritual person and um, right. for me religion is a source of my religion is a source of comfort. Um, right. um, what are your future plans? Um, well I would like to finish up grad school, which I start in the fall. Right. Um, um, and once that, I would like to become a rehabilitation counselor. Mm -hmm. I will be going into social work, but I all my ultimate goal is to become a rehabilitation counselor. Mm -hmm. um, I want to help um, people with disabilities for, for <coughs> with advocating and also help them reach their vocational goals. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to be more involved in the disability community. I, mm. I feel that it was a great source of comfort for me to know that there's a community out here mm -hmm. for, for me to be a part of. Well, Lily, would you please present some of your work now? Yeah, I, I, I would love to. Great, here we go. I do not have those early concrete memories of me the ones that have marked who I am to be, but they taunt me nonetheless when I dress but cannot distinguish color, only shades of lighter and darker. I do not feel that honor attributed to me for surviving, I do not remember. For a long time, I imagined babies and their shattered skulls, strewn bodies falling out of a car, dry, dusty heat and a mother searching for her wailing baby, already labeled as me, with severe head trauma, internal bleeding, and optic nerve atrophy. Still alive like it was my destiny, but I still do not know. Was she wearing sandals, my mother? Did stones cut through her chanclas as she searched? Was she attuned to smells around her like that of impending death? Or did she just follow her motherly instincts, kicking the dirt of her homeland, running, tripping, or walking with the serenity of shock? Was she whispering fervent prayers like I have often heard her, the words flowing out, bringing forth the force of which she is unaware? I still do not remember. The man who was my father, murdered before I was born, 
a political conspiracy consisting of brutality, leaving behind weeping widows and fatherless children. I am one of them, though I never met him. He did not smile down at me or pick out my name. Instead, I hold a frameless picture close to my face, trying to decipher a line, a contour of his visage to define him outside of my blindness. But he looks just like the rest. I see that blankness. In his last moments of agony, a bullet inscribed on his forehead. Only his ravings were heard by my mother. And I wonder if he remembered. Didn't he think of the unborn child? A part of me imagines, wishes that a wisp of his last breath placed me in God's hands so his unborn daughter would not be orphaned but looked after by the Holy Father. I do not remember. So I kneel upon my stricken moments, my chest pressed against the cold toilet bowl, hands on the floor, retching violently my stress and despair. I am anxious, I am trembling. My body hurts from the exertions because it makes no difference in what I remember and what has happened. The memories, the stories have taken their physical toll. So I plead, pray, and believe that there is a merciful God hearing me choke on my pain because I have always perceived that presence over me, that elation after intense suffering. And I remember the way my beliefs have been questioned, sometimes inspected with der derision, heatedly debating the existence of a God. I have no critical intentions. I believe in what I have not seen, but I am no less intelligent or uneducated by comparison for merely seeking refuge from what I deem oppressing. Because my history, my memories entangle me in lethargy and resistance, and it does not matter what I remember. Cringing from the remembered feel of my brother and mother's hand grips against my skin as they lay wrapped in hospital sheets after being shot. Or how I sat talking to a man I called Papi as a little girl, a father figure once more to be taken. And as he lay dying, all I could do besides cry was talk and sing hymns for him, for my sol solitude, for my rationality. The moment his body was removed from the bedroom, I stepped inside despondently to sing. Feliz el día en que escogí servirte mi Señor y Dios. The echoes of desperate guttural weeping and screaming will not recede, nor the feel of his warm, lifeless body in my arms, or the brittle porcelain coldness of his wrist seeping into my fingers through his shirt as he lay at rest in his casket, I understand that certain aspects are meant for me to remember. And what I do not, I will not forget. Wow, very good. Lily, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, I'm just really glad to be here. And uh, That's great. Well, we, I know what grad school's like, but mm -hmm. I hope you will come back. And uh, listen, the rehab counselors need you, because I know I feel rehab listening to you. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Lily, for being on our, the 15th anniversary of our show. And good luck. Thank you. This is Rob Rotman for Adapt Chicago Productions.